So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever is appropriate for your location. Uh, this is going to be our first session of, of an unknown number, maybe four, five, six. We'll kind of see how it goes. Uh, I am I'm kind of just hoping to to make this really interactive. So um, please ask questions. Um, if, if you want, just use the chat window to punch questions in. Uh, and that way, if something good comes up, I'll know who sent it in. And then I can ask you to unmute and we can just we can have a discussion about it. Um, the, the genesis of this, which I'm sure a lot of you saw, is I, I did a, uh, a Twitch stream with Chrissy Lemaire uh, about a month, month and a half ago, I guess. And we really got to talking about writing because she's she's been doing a lot of writing, um, kind of struggles with it in certain areas, which I think most people probably do. And I've been doing it a long time. I've gotten you know really fast at it, if nothing else. And so she just said, hey, you know, can we just talk about your process and how you work and everything else? And a lot of folks suggested that, you know, maybe there was room to expand on that. So I'm hoping folks kind of brought suggestions. What I wanted to do in this first session is, is almost make this like a table of contents. I'm going to kind of go over a whole bunch of stuff and then we can figure out which of those it makes sense to dive into deeper. And we can do that deeper diving in future sessions. We can do some of it today, whatever. We're only going to run for 45, 50 minutes today. Um, at most, so keep everyone's Saturday a little bit free. And I kind of want to start with acknowledging that one of the things people sometimes get wrapped up about with writing is is feeling that they have nothing to say. Like I don't like I want to write, but I don't know what to write about. I don't really have anything to contribute. Uh, I'm going to deliberately set that aside. We're going to spend a whole day, you know, a whole session talking about that. Uh, perhaps next time. So today we're going to kind of assume that you you do want to do some writing and you you kind of have some things you want to write about and maybe it's technical writing maybe it's short form technical writing like a blog post or, or magazine articles maybe it's long form like you want to write a book of some length um, maybe it's not technical at all maybe it's it's you want fiction uh, you want to tell a story or you want to write something non-technical uh, non-fiction kind of the, the the process for me is has been the same a lot either way I think. You know, so um, you guys, you have a little reaction button down here in the, the Zoom along the bottom. And there's a, uh, there's a couple of, of good ones. Um, just, you know, do like the thumbs up or something like that if you went to college and had writing classes in college. Yeah, 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 just about everybody. Uh, so first tip is uh, reach into your brain and delete that part. Uh, whatever they taught you is wrong. Um, but college classes, unfortunately, they, they've gotten a little better in, in recent years. I know a couple of people who teach writing in college, and I and we we talk about it a lot. Um, I didn't go to college, so I never had that in my brain. But college really, really tried to teach a, and, and a lot still do, tries to teach a formal type of writing. They it's like they want you to just be writing technical manuals your whole life. And anybody who's ever read a technical manual can tell you that that's some of the the hardest read, hardest writing to read. Uh, that's why folks don't like manuals very much. And so it's not very effective. Uh, and the problem is nearly everything they teach you about writing makes your writing harder to read. It makes it harder to write. Um, it, it's very stilted, it's very formal, it takes you out of your writing. And so the, the first thing is to really just delete all that. Um, I like to tell people, write like you talk. Uh, and, and I do that. I use contractions. And so I write with contractions. I refer to myself as I, and I refer to you as you. And so I write like that. Uh, I don't try to take myself out of the writing. I don't use the, the royal we. Like, I don't say things like, today we are going to learn. We're not going to learn shit. Hopefully you learn something. Um, but presumably I already know it or I wouldn't be here talking about it, right? So it's not we. It's, it's you. It's me. It's us. Uh, I actually, when I, I really first started writing, I would write two or three pages and then I would go back and read it to myself. And if it didn't sound right coming out of my mouth, I would change it. And years ago, uh, I was at a conference, I think it was probably a tech ed or something like that. And somebody came up and they said, you know, hey, I got one of your books. Would you mind autographing it? I'm like, sure. You know, I'm really glad you enjoyed it. He says, he says, actually, now that I've seen you speak, anytime I read your stuff, I'm going to hear your voice because you write exactly like you talk. I was one of the biggest compliments I think I ever got from someone. And they said, it just makes the writing so much easier because it's like you're reading a transcript and you're just having a conversation with someone. Try to focus your writing like that. Use, use tips like that. Read things back to yourself. If it sounds stilted to you or it doesn't sound like you, 
rewrite it until it does. Eventually, if you keep doing that, you're going to find that it becomes a lot more natural. Uh, you will wind up writing faster. Um, these days, a, a really good writing day for me is about 10,000 words. So if you look at a, a page in Word, which I imagine most people are, are at least vaguely familiar with, kind of using the default fonts and, and page settings and everything else, a page in Word is about 600, 700 words. So, you know, 10,000 is 15, 18 pages in there somewhere. It's, it's actually really fast. Most people don't write that fast. Um, you know, George R.R. R. Martin, for example, famously says he gets about three or four pages a day done. Uh, and that's actually not that unusual. Uh, a lot of writers really, really struggle to craft. And look, if, if you're writing literature, I guess it makes sense to struggle to really craft your words like that. But I don't, I mean, most of us, for the most part, are just trying to communicate. And so there's not a lot of extra value in spending that kind of time. Just write like you talk and get it done. Um, writing shouldn't be formal. It shouldn't, it shouldn't feel difficult. Like if, if you're having trouble expressing yourself and you're, you're probably trying too hard and you might, you might consider trying less hard. Uh, look at some of the stuff that you really, really like to read. Some of the stuff that's been really effective for you. That's really taught you something or, or a story that you have found just really drew you in and, and the words themselves kind of vanished and it became about the story. And for the most part, those things aren't, they're not really overwrought writing. Now, can, you know, take the other side of that. Um, how many of you have read uh, uh, Tolkien, you know, Lord of the Rings, stuff like that? That's actually a really good example of what I'm talking about. If you read the Lord of the Rings trilogy, that is some dense freaking writing. Like it is thick. He really went after. Part of this is the time it was written too, right? Like people talked a little bit more formally then, but it's, it's dense. Compare that to the writing in The Hobbit, which he wrote as a children's book. It flows better. It's easier. You get drawn in. The words don't get in the way. So even in fiction, you'll see that. Um, Terry Brooks is the author who wrote the, the Shannara books. I have wanted to read the Shannara books since I was like 15. And every time I pick one up, I can't get through it. Like it is, he goes on for four pages about the road and the pebbles that are in the road. And I, like, I get you're trying to create a vision for me here, but man, it's just so thick. It's hard to get through. So you really have to decide what the purpose of your writing is. Is the purpose of your writing to craft a piece of enduring literature? Or is the purpose of your writing to convey ideas and information to another human being? If you decide that the purpose is to convey information, then the words should get out of the way. It's not about the words. It's about what the words are saying. And you want to say it in a way that makes the most sense and is the easiest for the audience that you're writing for. Look, when Tolkien decided to write The Hobbit, he decided he wanted it to be a children's book. He knew he had to take a different writing approach because children aren't going to be able to get through a well-crafted piece of literature. They just they don't have the vocabulary all the time yet. Writing is very much about knowing your audience. Uh, it's, it's really difficult to write one size fits all. Another good fiction example is Piers Anthony. Uh, he writes mostly fantasy, a little bit of sci-fi here and there. His, his most popular books are his Xanth series. There's about 700 million Xanth books, I think. And he writes those in a very quick, very easy, they were written for children originally, um, young children, you know, 10, 12 years old in there, kind of starting to get into a young adult market. And he's, he's by and large kept that, that tone in his voice. You could probably, I mean, if you're a reader, you could probably blow through a Xanth book on one plane flight, um, maybe a couple of them. They're real quick, easy reads. On the other hand, he wrote uh, the tarot universe books uh, and they're much thicker, they're much denser, very much targeted at an adult audience. There's a lot of sexual situations and everything there that you would just not feed a kid. And so he wrote it very differently. So that one author, again, know your audience. What's going to be the right way for your audience to, to consume that? When I wrote the first PowerShell book, so I, I wrote um, Windows PowerShell TFM, and that came out in 2007. 
And this was just um, just a few months after PowerShell had come out. PowerShell was released in November 2006. So it was probably less than a year. Uh, and I wrote that book. And at the time, the people who were really jumping in and picking up PowerShell were the people who had been using VBScript. Um, it was pretty obvious that PowerShell was the successor to VBScript. And so if you go back and you look at the table of contents on that book, and you can still find it on Amazon, it is clearly a VBScript person's book of, on PowerShell. Like chapter three already has you in programming because a VBScript is a programmer. And so they're, they're very comfortable with that. That's what they're up for. And, you know, it's, it's like the first chapter is 15 random things about PowerShell that a VB scripter would need to know. And then boom, it's, it's basically like, here's how to turn your VB scripts into PowerShell. And that was fine for the time. Now you fast forward to 2000, I don't know, 10, maybe I forget when I wrote the first po Windows PowerShell month of lunches. I want to say it's around 2010 or something. At that point, the VB script people didn't need books anymore. They weren't buying books because there were only so many VB script people. They had all already bought the book and they were all using PowerShell. The audience to sell books to at that point was the people who had never done VB script. And when they picked up my first book, that TFM book, and they flipped it open and chapter three was about programming, they flipped it right back close and said, nope, not interested. I don't want to be a programmer. I thought this PowerShell thing was something different. If it's a programming language, I'm out. And so people started asking me for recommendations for PowerShell book. And I looked around and I realized what was happening. Everyone had written a PowerShell book for VB script people. It was all about programming. Nobody had written a book for that audience. So that's what the month of lunches book was. It was just the same information written for a different audience. When you're writing technology books or articles or blog posts or anything, Something to keep in mind is that you're not there to invent new information. And that's something that sticks a lot of people. A lot of times people say, you know, I, I have nothing to contribute. Everything's already been written. But that's not the point of writing, especially in technical writing. You're not there to create new information in the world. What you're there to do is take the information that's already in the world and package it for a different audience. You might be packaging it for an audience that speaks a different language or comes from a different culture. And so the examples and analogies you use to explain things are going to be appropriate for them. Uh, I use car examples a lot. Like I can explain anything in computers using a car analogy. Super proud of that. But if you come from a culture where car ownership is not common, my analogies don't work all that well. They're not a shared experience. And so someone has to have the information packaged a little differently if they come from that that different background. And that's what writing is. That's what teaching is. It's repackaging the information that's already in the world for a different audience. And once you think about it that way, you start to realize that your unique combination of language and style and cultural background and life experiences and perspectives, all of that is unique to you. And it gives you a unique voice. And that voice is going to resonate with someone else out in the world in a way that Sean's might not, mine might not, Joe's might not, but it's going to be right for someone. And so that's, that's why writing is worthwhile. Um, or, you know, doing videos, if that's what you're into, it doesn't have to be writing, but it's, it's, it's why teaching and, and, and telling those stories matters. So speaking of telling stories, there's a lot of different storytelling techniques in the world. What any writer, fiction, nonfiction, technical, doesn't matter. What any writer has to do is sit down and decide, okay, first of all, who's my audience? Who am I writing for? That's the starting point. Who is my audience today? What do they care about? What do they not care about? What do they already know? Who are they today? And the second step is, who do I want them to be when they finish this piece that I'm going to be writing? That's the journey. And all throughout the entire writing process, you have to constantly tell yourself, you are not writing for you. You are writing for them. You're writing for their story and you're writing for their journey. You're serving your reader and you have to do your level best to serve them as best you possibly can. 
that means typically crafting their story so it's one concise, continual plot line all the way to the end. No tangents, no diversions. Everything has to be brought together. Um, you know, we. how many of you watched Lost? Anybody? I know a bunch of us watched Game of Thrones when that was going through. Uh, what's another good example? So Lost was definitely an example of this. Game of Thrones was an example of this. Um, you know, those are, those are probably shared enough with this crowd. Both of those made some serious mistakes. Um, Lost, for example, went on for at least one season, possibly two seasons longer than its writers and showrunners originally intended. So what happens is, is as you start going along and telling a story, a lot of times there are some side stories. There are, there are subplots. And by the end of the story, you really need to bring those all together to a close. Otherwise, it's like, um, hey, what about this character over here? Like, like, what was that all about? Did that add any meaning whatsoever to this story? And if it doesn't, think about how you felt at the end of Lost. Like, I was super betrayed. I'm like, oh, this whole thing has just been a season of Dallas. It was all a dream at the end. Because they didn't know how they were going to wrap it up. The way they had originally intended to wrap it up didn't work anymore because they had bolted on two more seasons. And they'd started telling other stories. And then they just had to quickly tie it together at the end. That's frustrating as a reader. And so when you think about who is my reader today and who do, they, who do I want them to be at the end, that's the journey. And you need to stick with that mission. So a, a technical example of that would be my Month of Lunches book. That Month of Lunches book does not teach you everything you need to know about PowerShell to really be effective. That was not its goal. Its goal was to take someone who was starting in a particular place and take them to a particular place. It might be the first PowerShell book someone read, but I knew it wouldn't be the last one. I did not need to solve all the problems. I didn't need to teach all the things. I just needed to get them to a certain place. That means there's lots of stuff I didn't teach. There's lots of stuff I glossed over. There's lots of stuff that I, I only taught a little piece of it and I really didn't expand into the bigger picture on whatever it was I was teaching. So, you know, I, I, you have to make those decisions and you have to understand that every story needs to be its own complete story, but it's not the only story that's out in the world. A lot of us get really wrapped in our heads about, oh, oh, you have to know this, you have to know this. Well, but do I? Like, it, like if you only want to get me from here to here, that's all I need. Only what falls in between those things and only the, the most concise, smoothest, most distraction-free path from point A to point B. That's all you include. Uh, if you're just doing a blog article, the distance between point A and point B isn't very much, but you need to stick with that, right? I think, you know, when people start doing that, your writing, your writing improves massively. Um, Sergi asks, any particular tips around writing in foreign language for foreign audience? I don't write in foreign languages because I don't know any of them. Um, I know that when I have written in English for an audience who spoke English as a second or third language, I have had to spend a lot more time researching to make sure things like my analogies were going to work, um, to make sure that I was, I was removing American idioms, which I, I tend to use pretty, pretty aggressively as part of my normal day-to-day -day speech. Um, so I would often have someone in my target audience acting as a beta reader who could highlight stuff and say, yeah, this, this is not going to land. Uh, this isn't going to work. You know, you might try phrasing this differently. People are going to, you know, this, this phrase kind of has a different meaning in, in our country. So, I mean, you really have to engage with that audience. Um, oh, Joe, this is a good one. Why don't you unmute? We're going to talk about this a little bit. So All Joe right. asks, What's the length you suggest for chapters within different types of book in regard to page length, time per chapter, basic instructional, deep technical storytelling to teach fiction? I put so much research into this for the month of lunches. Now, have you heard the story about, have, I, have you heard me talk about how that book is constructed? Somewhat, but, but only the basics. All right, so the, the shtick with the book, right? The promise it makes is that if you read a chapter a day, during lunch, 
then I will get you from point A to point B. All right, well, now we have some time constraints, don't we? Like, I assumed it was only going to be business days, weekdays. All right, so now I've got about 20 days, 20, 22 days in the month, which means I, I, I've got 20, 22 chapters. So it's going to put some limits on what I can teach you. And how long is your, how long is your lunch break? Uh, typically an hour, right? And, and I yeah. think you even had it split out to be, you know, 40 minutes to read, 20 minutes for actual practice. So, yep. yeah. So I got on, I got on Google <clears throat> and I punched in average adult reading speed. And it, it works out like, you know, there's numbers all over the place from different studies, but I kind of took a, a, a mean and it works out to about 700 words a minute that someone can read, or maybe it was 600. And I multiplied that. I'm like, okay, if that's the, if that's the number of words per minute someone can read, then I multiply by about 45 minutes. And that's how many words my chapter can be. And that was it. So again, it's no, you know, when you're, when I, when I go to think about how long, what's too short, what's too long, I got to think about my audience, where are they engaging? And if that's the promise, if that's the attention span, then that's what I limit myself to. And that starts to, to tell me how much I can even get through. And, and, you know, it is one of the first questions you have to ask yourself on this journey from A to B, like, like if it's technical, I feel people have to reach a point where they have achieved some success. Like they have to feel they've, they've done something in order to keep going. And so that, that kind of drives how each chapter gets constructed. Now, you know, look, a different type of book, right? Have you read uh, PowerShell in depth? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> different, right? That one's a reference. Right. So it's not really meant to teach. It's something that you would get into and refer. And so the chapter links are all over the place because kind of the presumption is you're not going to read the book cover to cover. You're going to dive into the bit you need, read the bit you need and as long as they need to be to teach whatever that chapter is about. There's not really a, a strong logical organization around that book. Uh, each chapter is basically a feature. That's the one that Manning asked you to write a V2 for. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And, and what did you say? You said no. No, I, I, I just told him I'm, I'm totally on the fence on this one. I said, I really need to talk to you and talk to Jeff because I, I'm scared shitless, oh. honestly, to, to pick it up. You've got my blessing. Jeff might be willing to rev it with you, actually. Yeah. Um, I want nothing. I, to I had do a with short it. chat with him about some stuff, but yeah. I want nothing well, and, to do but with, that was, with writing that was, technical books anymore. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing was, you know, really about this to to see a lot of the things that you've written and, and how your flow has changed from, you know, the the PowerShell TFM 1.0 to uh, all of the month of lunches series, which were, you know, great to to have that design and that short iteration that everybody could go through a little bit at a time versus the deep technical. And then, you know, when I mentioned storytelling to teach, to me, that one was even getting into your uh, instructional design for mere mortals or, or all the versions of Be the Master, right? Yep. The storytelling and, and um, you know, throwing in the bits of the blacksmith to try and get everybody to understand something that's outside of their realm, but that, that would help them, you know, kind of anchor their existing knowledge to what it is you're trying to present to them and, and how this should make sense to them along the way versus your, your fiction stuff. So that was really what I was trying to figure out was just, you know, how do the different types of books really change what's going to end up being your um, yeah. chapter length, you know, or depth? Yeah. And I, I think, you know, you, you bring up a good point too with, with storytelling and it, it's a word that gets overused a lot now, like everybody, you know, on LinkedIn and social and, and everybody who wants to be a, a, a guru just latches on to strict, you know, we've got to be a storyteller and storytelling and blah, 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 blah. But, but at the core of that, like once you strip away all the, the, the hype that's gotten laden on it the past couple of years, it really is, is true. So, you know, walk back a little bit and think about some of the best classes you've ever attended. Uh, I mean, in grade school, as well as, you know, grad, undergrad school or, or anything else that you've taken. And the, the problem with the human brain is that, is that everyone familiar with Bloom's taxonomy? Anyone ever seen this? All right, I'm gonna do a little screen share here. Let me get the browser window pulled up first. And I wanna see if I can find the, the image version of this. Yeah, here we go, okay. All right, so 
push the screen share button. This is a, a really interesting bit that uh, most people don't realize about the human brain. So Bloom's, Bloom was a, a cognitive science and, and instructional design dude um, back a zillion years ago. And there's of this taxonomy now, they've, they've reworded some of these. Uh, this is the original, uh, it's the one I still like. So this is the cognitive domain version. And what this does is it, it tries to illustrate how the human brain learns at different levels and how those levels build on one another. So at the bottom, you've got knowledge. And knowledge is like memorizing your times tables. Um, everybody remember doing that. Uh, it was around fourth grade for me and, and I freaking hated it. And it, it proves that just brute force application of repetition can work to shove information in your head. But it doesn't mean you can do anything with that information, right? Just being able to recite something back just makes you a parrot. Understanding is knowing what that information means. Application is knowing how to put it into use in the real world, right? You move all the way up to things like this is, is, is really the capstone for what most formal education tries to achieve. Um, evaluation kind of comes at, with life experience. Synthesis means you know something, you understand it, you know how to use it. And more importantly, you know how to connect many things that you know and understand and form new information. Synthesis is, is really the, the, the crux of the human brain. So here's the thing with, with teaching. You can't, you can't really make the process more efficient. The human brain is not a computer. We use computer analogies to talk about the brain a lot, but they're, they're inaccurate. It's a piece of meat. It's a piece of meat that was designed to keep us alive when we were swinging through trees, getting chased by tires, right? It behaves in certain ways that are almost directly aligned to those survival instincts. So you can't really, you can't really take away the learning. What you can do though, what teaching is doing, and so this, this applies to writing really any kind of teaching. When you're teaching someone something, you're not trying to, to take away the experience. You're just trying to make it faster. That's all. So, so look, um, you know, rather than, than you going out as a, as a student and having to rediscover all of science for yourself, I can teach some of it to you. I can compact that time. But if I only recite things to you, if I just tell you facts, then all you're going to get is knowledge. You're not going to get into understanding application synthesis. So that's one of the reasons why when you go into the traditional instructor-led classroom for technology classes, you have hands-on labs, right? The idea is to give you some facts. That's in the book. The instructor is then there to help explain those, to help you understand those facts. And then you have a lab that lets you sit down and do some application. So you're getting about halfway up the pyramid. Hopefully then you go home and start analyzing how that fits into your real work life and you start connecting it to other things you already know. And now you're nearing the top of the pyramid. But, but I can't ever just recite things to you. I can't just tell you things and have you actually achieve a high cognitive level. So that's a very long-winded way of coming around back to storytelling. Storytelling and teaching is the idea that I can't just recite facts at you. I've got to tell you a story. I have to tell you about how I failed and what I did to correct that failure and how I ultimately succeeded. Because now you're getting comprehension. You're getting application. I hope, I'm hopefully telling the story to you in a way that relates to your own background and your own experiences because now you're going to be able to synthesize what I'm telling you into your own understanding of the world. So it, it's why, for example, in the month of lunches books, I typically start each chapter with a problem. Like, okay, you need to do this. This is what you want to do. And I'm relying on the reader to go, yeah, that, that is a thing I want to do. I'm like, okay, well, here it is. Step one, step two. Oh yeah. You know what? But step two didn't work. Here's why step two didn't work. Here's what you might do to fix that. And I lead them through 
the same thing that they might have done on their own organically, but because I'm leading them, it happens faster. But they still relate to that story in each step of the way because I need them to get up to the synthesis level. I need them to connect it to things they already know. Fiction storytelling is actually no different. I can't just tell you a story. I have to, I have to let you relate to it in a way. So, you know, if, if I'm describing a, a young wizard who's in school, I need to give you things that you, you remember from your own school experiences. Now, here's a funny thing about Harry Potter is he's an English wizard in an English school system. And so a lot of what J.K. Rowling hung on would have been very familiar to an English reader. And it's kind of a miracle that when it came across the pond to the United States, it landed as well as it did, because the whole concept of boarding school is largely foreign to Americans. The whole concept of, of houses within a school, like we just kind of accepted it as part of the story, but, but she was drawing on a shared experience that, that the English culture has. And so fiction, you try to do the same thing. You try to create things that the reader can relate to, that they can see themselves in, that they can understand so that you can draw them into the world a little deeper and help them synthesize the fictional bits into their view of the world and into what they already know to be true. And that's what, that's what gives people the willingness to suspend their disbelief and buy in because you've started from an area of at least somewhat realism and you're, you're pulling them in at a time and you're walking them through the same experience. Um, so someone asked a question here, where do you get your ideas for a book? Um, I, don't, I don't, you didn't have your first That's, name, so I'll just say. Sorry, Don, so, it's Carlton. No, oh, hey, Carlton. So do you mean tech books or fiction books? Both. So fiction books is really easy. Um, I usually wake up with the germ of the, of the story, like the, the, the shtick of the story uh, from a dream. And then I'll take some furious notes. I've probably got a dozen story ideas that I'd love to write about someday. Um, so I, I, I take notes. I might write I might write two or three chapters. Like if you've gone on LeanPub, so leanpub.com slash sparks, um, those are all like two or three chapters of story ideas that I've had. And that's how I kind of capture the idea for myself so that I can come back to it later. And, and I don't forget what I was thinking about is I'll just write two or three chapters. Um, those chapters might not ever wind up in a book. Daniel Scratch, the entire story literally came to me in a dream and I bolted straight awake and I, I knew I had to start writing. So I started furiously scribbling notes down on a piece of paper. Um, and I started writing the book the next day and I finished it in two weeks um, because it was just, it was that vivid. Um, and then, you know, for the subsequent books, there was definitely more outlining. In fact, I'll show you some of that in a little bit. Tech books, that's kind of a different story. When I started, when, so I, I went independent kind of not by choice. Um, in 2000, I was working for craftopia.com in Westchester, Pennsylvania. It was an arts and crafts e-tailer uh, that had been founded by some of the QVC executives who, who'd left QVC. And I was working for them as a lead web developer. And they came to us at Christmas time. We, we'd had a lot of trouble getting our third round of funding. And they came to us at Christmas time and said, you know, look, we know it's been really tough. We, we appreciate everybody pulling through the holiday season. Um, and this third, we know the third round has just been really, really stressing everybody. But go home, have a good Christmas, like enjoy the holiday. Um, don't come back. We're out of money. And it's, and it's over. So, of course, everyone's like, ah. I, uh, I had just gotten my first book deal. And it was uh, to write a book called the Microsoft.net e-commerce Bible. And I went home and we had a little discussion with the family about financial futures and decided that I was going to do that. So the first two years I was independent, um, I wrote six books a year on literally whatever topic a publisher would pay me in advance to write a topic on. And if you go back and you look at some of my older books, they are all over the freaking map. It's PHP, it's application center, it's commerce server, it's like it's it's random stuff. When I decided that I needed to focus the career a bit more, I started getting a little more tactical about it. And so 
probably from the time I wrote the book called VB Script WMI and ADSI or Managing Windows with VB Script WMI and ADSI or some combination of those acronyms. Uh, that was a tactical decision and a strategic decision. I wanted to to do something in a market that I felt was being underserved. Like that that was a that was a business plan. Um, I when I wrote the TFM book, it was because it it fit right into that space. When I left Sapien Technologies, which is is where Jeff and I were, we were employees when we wrote that book, and it was published by Sapien Press. When I left, I wasn't going to write any more books. I wasn't going to write another PowerShell book for sure. So it wasn't until I started seeing another need in the marketplace that wasn't being served that the month of lunches idea started to come to me and I started researching it and designing that series. So again, it was a, it was a business case. It was very much a, a tactical move to achieve a, a particular business outcome. I will admit, um, especially if I've had a drink, that the, the fiction writing kind of has a tactical bit to it as well. The, the Daniel Scratch books, the Witch Kind books, for example, are, are vaguely young adult because that market kicks ass. Like you can just sell a shit ton of books in that market. Um, the length of them, they're roughly 55,000, 60,000 words is entirely aligned with the binge reading habits of a Kindle unlimited subscriber. And the idea there is that you spend a crap ton of effort getting people into your first novel, which is why Daniel Scratch is 99 cents. And then you want them to binge read the next one and 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 the next one. And, the next one. Um, and that works really, really well in YA. It works really, really well in, in romance, um, which I kind of kick myself that I don't think I could write a romance book because those people pump books out and they make bank. Like I could probably quit my job if I could if I could get smut somehow to just flow. Um, there's a, a few other genres like that. One is called uh, lit RPG, literature role playing game, and and the shtick with lit RPG is that the main character of your story is in an immersive virtual reality, massively multiplayer online role playing game. And is aware of it is aware that they're in a game because they get the they get the game notifications. You know, you lost five hit points, you gained 100 XP. Um, people and, and people go, oh, you mean like Ready Player One? Like 10% Ready Player One. Like that, that's the that's the happy meal version of Lit RPG, right? Like when you get into it, it's there. And so uh, thank you, Joe. Um, I I made a deliberate decision to take one of my story ideas called Truth Sayer, which originally had nothing to do with Lit RPG. Um, in fact, if you if you read that Sparks book, which is free on LeanPub, by the way, you can download it for free. There is a a, a, a few chapters of a, a story called Truthsayer, and you can see what that was intended to be. But I I converted it into lit RPG because I wanted to see if I could tap that market and was able to get a publishing contract with a publisher in that space. Very strategic. Um, had to had to outline the living crap out of that book. And like, I'm not even kidding. I'll show you the outline. In fact, uh, let me get it open over here in Scrivener. Um, this story did not just flow. I, I had to, I had to earn this. Uh, here we go. And the sky truth sayer. So so this is Scrivener, this is the tool I use to write in. And you can see here, get this stupid bar out of the way. There we go. Up here, there you go. Um, you know, there's some 23 chapters and then down here you can see the sheer amount of notes. Like this, this is the, the main story Bible where like I keep all my references um, because I kept losing track of how many experience points you had to get for a given character level. I literally had to go through and and like redo the math eight times because I would just get lost in my head. Uh, like this is the guy's running character sheet that I have to update as I go. So like a computer would keep track of this in a real RPG, right? No, I had to do all this here. Um, this is the the freaking book, guys. Like I literally started with okay, Act One. Broadly, this is what's going to happen. Act Two. Boom. And there were originally like nine acts and, and I kind of tightened it up a little bit as I went. But then with, with each of these, it's like, okay, here's a chapter. 
And here's all the crap that has to happen in this chapter. And when I write this chapter, all these things need to occur. And you can even see as I've gone, I've put check marks. Okay, got that. Okay, got that. All right, got that. Because this is the story. And I know if I tell all these things, then it'll make sense at the end. Um, this sucker is 100,000 words. Yeah, 99,877. This is the longest single thing I've written. Um, this took a month, month-ish. Um, but, but that's the level of, of outlining I had to do here. And, and I probably spent a week on this outline. And like Christopher and I sat down and just went back and forth about different things. And, and it's got all the subplots and everything else that, that play into this thing. And, and I just had to go through and write the whole thing. So I would do a chapter or two a day in some cases. Um, how much time do you typically spend or how many iterations when evaluating your outline table of contents before I start writing? I, I am an aggressive outliner. In fact, we'll, we'll make that a, a topic for, for a whole workshop. I will sit you down and, sh and show you my entire outlining process. Because once I get the outline done, I can write a book really damn fast, really fast. Um, but it, it really all comes down to the outline. So we'll, we'll spend a bunch of time on that. Um, so I'm, I'm on the second Which Kind trilogy. And we took a little vacation and went over to the, the JW Marriott Desert Ridge in Phoenix uh, and basically camped in a, a poolside cabana for three days. So we had our own little bubble. So no, no. And I, over that, that long weekend, I outlined the, the entire trilogy. And Chris and I just sat there and we would float around the pool talking about ideas and get out. And I'd take a bunch of notes and write them down and then start rearranging. So, I mean, that was probably a solid week. Um, how much of your story do you outline for technical content versus fiction? I, I outline technical content even more aggressively. Um, I don't outline blog posts, partly because I've been doing the outlining thing for so long that it comes very easily to me if it's all contained in one page. Like if I don't have to coordinate my brain across multiple writing sessions, right? My outline is my state. So I have to sit down and I have to load my state and then I can continue writing. And the outline is how I do that. So if it's just one blog post, I can outline it in my head and write because once I'm done, I'm never going to look at it again. I don't need to reload that state. But if it's going to span multiple writing sessions, I have to outline it. Um, yeah, we're going to, I'm in a hotel room. Now. There's no pens anymore because of the stupid virus. So hang on, I'm going to take technical notes. So we're going to do outlining. Uh, we're going to do using Scrivener. And even if you're writing, if you're writing technical content or fiction content, Scrivener is freaking awesome. It, um, I literally will not touch Microsoft Word anymore. I freaking hate Word now. I am so, so much happier with Scrivener. But Scrivener will make you put your head through a window. It is, there is so much in it and it is so complicated and it's all hidden. Um, so we're going to do a little Scrivener tutorial. Um, oh, Carlton, you're not, <laughs> when you co-author, how do you decide who writes what? All right, look, I hate editorial passes. Like I hate them a bunch. I, you can ask, um, so, um, Fran, I forget Fran's last name. She was the development editor on that soft skills book that I just finished for Manning which we just changed the title of for a third time. So I don't even know what the title is anymore. Um, I'm an asshole and she'll tell you, like I am a raging lunatic with editing. I go, she'll put something like, you know, I feel you could give another example here. I'm like, you're an idiot. Like I'm bad. I hate it. So every book that you've ever seen me with a co-author, I wrote the whole book and the co-author added their bits and took on all the editorial passes. Um, that's why Jeff Hicks is like he is. That's why he can't like walk in straight lines um, because he's had to do all the editorial passes on every PowerShell book that we've written together. Um, uh, the first book I ever had a co-author with, you can go look this up, was called E-Commerce for Dummies. And I had two co-authors. One wasn't a co-author. 
he was an analyst and he was co-author so that we could have access to the um, IDC's research on the subject. The other is Mark Scott. Mark Scott didn't write a word of that book. He got paid half uh, and he earned it by doing the editorial passes because the first editorial pass we got back on that, they're like, oh, you really need to get this more into the dummy style. I'm like, nope, hard pass, out of here. Uh, Mark, how about this? I'll write the whole book in two weeks and then I don't want to hear about it again. Um, so I, that is probably not a typical co-authoring experience for most people, but that's, it's because I hate the editorial process. Even for the fiction books, I found a woman and the only reason that I can handle being edited by her is because she goes out of her way to be like extra ego, emotional stroking. Like she's, oh, this is so good. This made me laugh so much. And by the way, this, this should be a comma here. I'm like, oh, oh, but this is so, so like I can get through it. I'm really terrible. Uh, do you get input at specific stages of your writing, such as when you're working out your outline TOC, first few chapters, first few half of a book? If you're writing for a publisher, yeah, all those. Um, you get a ton of feedback on your TOC. You get feedback on every single chapter. You'll get broader feedback about halfway through. You'll get more feedback when you think you're done. Um, there's a lot of input. Uh, I don't always love it. You've got to have a thick skin. Like I should show you that this one end reviewer for the soft skills book apparently hates me personally and made it abundantly clear in their reviews. And I went back to the publisher and I'm like, why would you send this to me? Like, th this is not help. You're a monster. Why would you send this to me? Now I want to drink. Um, the fiction books, I, I, as some of you know, um, I, I rely on a small group of beta readers to, to make sure I'm covering things that it's not going too slow, not too fast. Um, self-publishing beta readers, usually, um, not so much on the table of contents. I think, I think people actually have trouble imagining a table of contents becoming a book, but as I get writing, that's where I want, I want the feedback. All right. So look, we've, we've got a couple of good, good future sessions. Um, next weekend, it's the same URL and we're going to go over outlining. Um, I've not scheduled the March ones yet. So if you're still on the newsletter, you'll get the March ones. Uh, we're going to try and go on vacation for a couple of weeks because I need to change the scenery really bad. Um, so when we come back, it, it'll be after the middle of March that we schedule the next ones. Uh, so one last one here from Joe. After the number of books you've written and the changes with tools, platforms, and publishers, do you suggest that authors go self-publish or work with a publisher house for their first book? So we are going to talk about that too. We're gonna talk about the business of writing um, because I have thoughts. Um, and, and as someone who, who just signed with a fiction publisher for the first time, um, and incidentally, uh, all right, so I have to do a little brag. I, most of you probably saw, on, yeah, bring drinks for that one. Most of you probably saw on Twitter that I got approached by an agent who saw my Kirkus reviews for Daniel Scratch and wanted to know if I was interested in representation. So I spoke to her a couple of days ago. Um, she's based in France, but it's, it's her agency is US based. She used to work for HarperCollins uh, and Simon and Schuster. So like she knows what the book market is. Her brother-in-law is the screenwriter for all but one of the Harry Potter movies. And she tells me this and I'm like going, keep talking. Um, she, so the, the, the which kind books were all self-published, right? They're, the only editing I had was proofreading. She wants me to work with a structural editor to tighten the books up a little bit in some places, which is beneficial, I, I, I no doubt. Um, she wants to rep the books and take them to a big publishing house because she, she said, I absolutely see if we can get these in the right hands and we get them in the right shape that someone will offer you movie rights. I'm, like, I'm gonna quit my job. Um, so I'm, I'm super, super excited about that. Uh, okay, so look, I'm going to wrap. Um, I'm going to go get some breakfast. And we'll, I'll see you next time. We're going to talk about outlining. Um, we will definitely have a